Don't drop that pin in the sump. Don't drop that pin in the sump. Don't drop that f Hello Internet. My name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. Regular viewers will know I recently did a complex and tricky line boring operation on a difficult casting. And the operation itself went really well, except that I crashed my lathe in the middle. It was a very complicated and long machining operation. I had to keep a lot of things in my head at once and there was a lot of steps. My concentration lapsed for a moment and the carriage crashed into the tailstock. So something in there is now bent and I need to figure out what. So let's get it apart and see if we can fix it. Here's the problem. Every fourth turn or so, the carriage has a very big sticky spot in it. It's really hard to get it past that point every four turns. So something in the apron there is probably bent. And how did this happen? Well, I was turning this complex casting here. I was actually line boring it, so it's fixtured on the cross slide. And on one of the passes, my concentration lapsed for a moment and I allowed it to collide with the tailstock, which pushed the tailstock back while locked, which took a lot of force. And although nothing was damaged on the work and I finished the operation, now the carriage is doing this. I'm gonna to need to get that carriage apart. So to the manual for the exploded parts diagrams, these things are invaluable for this kind of job. So I've got good coverage on the apron there and also the quick change gearbox, which has some information about the left end of the lead screw, but the lead screw assembly itself is not covered by the manual. However, it does have this coupler marked here, which is gonna be key. That'll tell me how to get the lead screw apart. Now there's a bunch of stuff on the back of the apron that encloses the lead screw. So I can't pull the apron off by itself, even though there's four bolts here that would drop it down, the lead screw's trapping it. So the lead screw has to come away with it as one entire assembly here. So step one is gonna be disconnecting the lead screw from the lathe. Now there's a taper pin there that's marked in the parts diagram on this coupler, but there's also a brass pin here. It's brass, I assume it's a shear pin if you crash the lathe with the half nut engaged so you don't damage the lead screw. So I think I'm gonna knock that brass pin out because that'll be easiest. So I'll tap, tap, tap that out of there and that's uh, not moving. Feels like I'm hitting solid steel there so clearly that's the wrong end to be tappy tap tapping on. I thought this pin would be straight because it's brass but it might actually be a taper pin so I'll flip that around and Tappy tap tap the other side, and out it comes. And look at that, it is in fact tapered. I didn't know tapered pins came in brass, but there you go. Figured being a shear pin, it would be straight, but live and learn. So that's loose in there now, so I think that'll slide out of that coupler. Over to the other end now, there's a pillow block there with a bushing that that end of the lead screw rides in. So there's some Allen head cap screws that I can fish out of there, and we'll see if this thing pulls off of there. Pulling this whole block off looks a lot easier than trying to fish the lead screw out of the block. However, it is still retained by some alignment pins there. I tried moving the carriage to the far end to see if that would give me enough slack to clear those alignment pins, but it does not. So those pins need to come out of there somehow. Now the pins are threaded in the center, so I thought, okay, maybe I can thread something in there and pull them out with a little bit of leverage there, but this did not work. So I thought, okay, maybe they're actually threaded pins. So maybe it's a jam nut kind of situation. So I put a jam nut on there and tried to twist them out of there and that did not work either. So then I thought, okay, maybe these are supposed to be pulled out using those threads. So I put a large nut over the pin as just a spacer. And then I threaded my bolt back into the pin and then just tightened that down and used it as like a little puller to pull the pin out. And this felt like it was working. So I continued and sure enough, out came the tapered pin. Most of my mechanical rebuilding knowledge comes from cars and farm machinery where tapered pins are not really much of a thing, so this was all a learning experience for me. But with a little deduction and not forcing anything, you can usually figure out how these things work. Now before I pull the rest of the hardware out, I want to support this end of the lead screw. I don't want it to sag too much here under its own weight, so there we go. That pillow block is loose, so I'll set that on there. And now, in theory, I should be able to get the apron off. So I'll clean several years of chips out of the bolts there. And I'm going to block up the bottom here so it doesn't fall too far because the left end of the lead screw is still attached. So what I'm doing is just lowering the apron down slightly onto those wood blocks so that I can get the bolts out and then hopefully slide the entire assembly to the left 
to pull the lead screw clear of that coupler. However, there are alignment pins here as well. So the threads on those are full of chips. I flush them out with some WD-40. And then once again in with my tiny little bolt puller arrangement. This is why it's good to always have a big stock of Imperial and Metric hardware on hand. The threads in these taper pins happen to be M4 by 0.7. And out it comes, and that taper pin is covered in crud for some reason, not entirely sure why. And get the other one out, and now let's see if I can fish this carriage out of here. And turns out the lead screw would slide on its own, actually, I didn't have to do it in quite that order, but out came the lead screw. And now I can fish the entire assembly out of there. Just gotta get under the cross slide hand wheel, there we go, result. Onto the bench and let's get a look at this thing. That stuff I'm setting it on is called Pig Mat, by the way, which I will link to below. It's great stuff. It comes in three flavors, stuff that absorbs oil and not water, or water and not oil, or both. It's used by boaters a lot in their bilges to fish the oil out while leaving the water for the pumps, but I first learned about it from Adam Booth. It's really great stuff for oily projects like this. This is a great chance to see how the keyway drive works on these small lathes. There's a worm gear there that slides along this keyway, and as the lead screw turns, it taps power off of that keyway without actually touching the threads. So you don't wear out the lead screw, but you don't need a separate drive shaft for the power feed. It's a nice compromise in these mid-range hobby lathes. Then when I engage the power feed for the carriage, it slides those gears forward, and that worm gear is now driving the primary drive on the pinion there that moves along the rack under the front of the lathe bed. And then if I go back into neutral and then over and down, the gear slides the other way, and that engages a gear upwards behind the hand wheel on the cross slide, and that's the power cross feed on this lathe. Back to the problem at hand. I'll see if I can reproduce the problem here on the bench. And sure enough, after four turns, there's the tight spot right there. So that's good news. If I couldn't reproduce the problem, then it might be somewhere else on the lathe, but it's definitely here in this gearbox. So I'll mark the tight spot here with some tape and I want to see where in the cycle correlates with the problem. So there's the sticky spot there again, tape is on top, and another four times around. Yeah, sure enough, when that tape is on top, there's the stick. So the sticky spot is clearly in the drive pinion itself or in something directly attached to that based on the ratio of the problem. So I put an indicator on that drive pinion and well, yeah, there's your problem. We've got a full 50 thou of runout in that drive pinion. You can see the weeble wobble in it there. That is pretty terrible. That's clearly what I bent. So let's get this thing apart and see what we can do about fixing it. So there's a roll pin there holding this drive gear onto the shaft. And according to the parts diagram, there should be nothing else retaining that pinion shaft in there. So I'll tappy tap tap that out. And of course there isn't clearing in the casting to tap it out. So I had to find a creative angle actually a couple of different angles to where I could sneak it out of there. Luckily there was just enough room or I don't know what I would have done. Drill it out maybe. And now let's see if that pinion will pull out of there. Boy, that is really stuck in there. It's turning in there, so it's free. It's just, I can't pull it out probably because it's bent. So we'll try a little bit of leverage there. And yeah, that is moving now. So we're winning. This is just really stuck in there. A little bit of leverage and I've moved it a little further. And then I ran out of fulcrum and had to step up to something a little larger. And we are winning here, but it is quite thoroughly stuck in there. And there we go. Okay, looking good. Got the pinion drive shaft out. And yeah, that sure is bent. And throw a straight edge on there and see how bent that is. No doubt about that. If I put the straight edge on the ground part of the shaft there, you can see that that is actually very straight. The bend is only apparent when I check the entire length there. So it looks like the bend has all occurred right on this spot right here, which is interesting. That makes sense. That's the thinnest part of the shaft there. That's where it would be weakest. This entire shaft has been machined out of one piece, it looks like. So one option to fix this would actually be to cut it off right there where the bend is and then bore that out, make a new shaft, slide it in there and maybe pin it like with a brass shear pin for safety for the future, something like that. But because the bend is all right in that choke point there, which I think that narrow section is actually clearance for the grinding wheel that is used to grind the part of the shaft that runs in the bearings, because the bend is all right there, I'm going to try to straighten this thing. 
So I'll put it between centers on what remains of my lathe here and just try to find where the high spot is. Hopefully the bend is all in one place and in one direction. If it's messier than that, then this idea may not work. But sure enough, the bend is right there and it's only in one direction, which is great news. So I just marked the high spot of the bend there. If the indicator was weeble wobbling all over while we were spinning, then there could be multiple bends in it, which would be bad news for me. So out comes the big guns. I've got my acetylene torch here with a very small brazing tip on it so I can get real laser focused with the heat there. And I'm just gonna really superheat that narrow choke point there where the shaft changes size so that I can apply my reverse bend just in that spot. Then I prepared my Precision Sterrett Machinist's framing hammer and proceeded to give it a couple of gentle persuasions in the downward direction right on the high spot there which I have pointed upwards. And uh, well, I don't know, I guess it does look a little straighter? It's hard to tell. Well, I had to let it cool down and then put it back between centers and let's see if that made any difference. And the answer is yes it did. We took about 10 thousandths out of that bend. so. This does seem to be working, so I just gotta do more of that. So I went and did another round of heating and beating, and now we've got another 10 thousandths out of it. So progress is slow and steady. So I did a couple more rounds of that, and this is about as good as I could get it. Now it's still got 10 thousandths of run out here, but what you're not seeing is that I went too far once and had to bend it back the other way, and so I didn't wanna push my luck trying to get it too much better than this. So I decided I would do a test fit with it in this state and see how it is. If it's not good enough, I can try this again, but I'm chasing my tail here, so I gotta call it at some point. Of course, the torch makes a mess of the part, and I gotta get it cleaned up because those ground surfaces need to be shiny once again so they can run in those bearings without chewing them up. I started trying to do this by hand with Scotch-Brite and Emery, and then I remembered I still have most of a working lathe, so I went ahead and chucked it up in the remains of my lathe, and this went a whole lot quicker, so I was able to polish that shaft back to its shiny original form with some 320 grit emery and then uh, I spent more time working on the area where the torch was heating because that was quite charred and stained and messed up. But a little bit of work and that all came out shiny new again looking very smooth except for one little spot where I couldn't get that black soot mark out. It seems to be in a low spot on the shaft so I just left it because it's smooth to the touch. And now, oh, that slides right in there perfectly, including the little pop into the bearing at the far side. Clearly the bend is what was making that hard to remove, and now it spins extremely freely. In fact, you can even freewheel it a little bit. So that is night and day better. I'm cautiously optimistic that the remaining 10 thou of bend in that shaft is not gonna hurt anything. So I'll try and reassemble it with the gear now. And putting some oil on things there just to make sure those bearings have some in there. The oiling system in this apron is not great. It's just a very simple oil bath at the bottom that's expected to somehow splash oil up over all of this stuff. And now I can line up the roll pin and I'll fish that roll pin back in the hole being very careful not to drop it into the sump at the bottom because that would be really super annoying. I think I see it down there. So see if I can fish it out of there with forceps and not quite enough room. So I had to pull the pinion out again, remove the gear and give myself clearance to fish the roll pin out of there with the forceps. <sighs> okay, take two, being a little more careful this time. And this time I got it and I can tappy tap tap it back into place. Okay, let's see how that motion is. Oh, that's brilliant perfectly smooth, no more signs of stickiness in there. So that's looking really good. So I think we may have it. While I have it all apart though, I'm gonna change the oil because I mean, it's never gonna get easier than this to do it. So I'll drain that out of there. It's been at least a year since I did this, so I'm sure it's due. And yeah, that's looking a little on the dirty side. It should be bright red, so it was probably due. All right, to refill it, I'm using this stuff here. This is your basic 75W80 manual transmission gear oil. This is what the manual recommends, but if in doubt, this stuff's always good for unpressurized oil bath systems like this. 
The only thing you really can't use is automotive engine oils because they have detergents in them. They're designed for pressurized oil systems with filters in them. So the detergents hold impurities in suspension so that the filter can catch it. With a passive oil bath system like this, you want the opposite. You want the impurities to fall to the bottom of the sump and stay there. So I fill it until it's at the center dot on the sight glass there. This is a little high, but it's not sitting level on the bench. So trust me, that's just fine once it's leveled out. And I'll do the quick change gearbox as well, because you never want to do one and not the other. Otherwise, they'll get out of sync on their changes. And the drain plug in this one's in kind of a stupid place. You can sort of catch some of the fluid, but mostly I just let it run out into a pile of pig mat. There's only like a quarter of a cup of oil in there, so the pig mat can handle that no problem. So I just let it run right out onto that. And then once that's done draining, get the plug back in there, and you can just kind of scoop that pig mat right up, and it'll absorb that oil no problem. Off to the recycler we go with all of that. Now in with the new stuff, I'll use the fill plug here since I don't have it apart on the bench conveniently. The only trick here is you gotta fill it kinda slowly because it takes a while for that thick oil to run down into the sight glass. So you gotta take your time and go slower between each squeeze than I'm doing here. Otherwise you will easily overfill it after it sits there for a while, as I did just there. That is definitely over full, so I had to drain a little more out of it. Okay, let's see if I can muscle this thing back together. So I'm going to try to do the reverse of removal, but I did learn a few things about doing this in the removal process. I'll clean the underside of the saddle there to make sure I'm not trapping chips or anything between the components here. And I'm cleaning out all of the connections there because it turns out they open into the gearbox below. So I don't want to dump a bunch of crud in the gearbox. So I got the bolts started, and what I learned from taking this apart is that the lead screw actually slides freely behind the carriage. So you don't have to move the carriage to uncouple the lead screw from the gearbox like I did. You can just slide the lead screw out and then drop the apron. For all these interfaces, I'm putting the bolts in not quite tight and then tapping in the taper pins to align everything and then tightening the bolts all the way and then finishing by tapping the taper pins one more time just to make sure that they're seated. That seemed to work well. I don't know if that's the proper way to do this, but eh, seems fine. Now I can reattach the lead screw, find the big end of the taper hole and tap that brass shear pin back in there. Okay, back at the other end, I'll just flip this pillow block around and it, uh oh, oh no. Not enough room to flip it around. Ah, oh, Imperial fist shake. It's okay, I got this. Disconnect the lead screw coupler, slide it over clear of the lathe, and then I can I can flip it around. Clip, oh, double Imperial fist shake. Just gotta just make a little space with the cabinet and the drill press and the, yeah. okay, there we go. Result. Same process back here, start the bolts, tap in the tapered pins, snug up the bolts, and then finish tapping in the pins. That seems to be working just fine there as well. And I'm also oiling and cleaning as I go. Okay, moment of truth, remove the packing blocks. How did we do? Does the carriage move? Oh, look at that. Smooth as glass, all the way up and down. Results. That's very, very exciting. Very happy to have that fixed. Quick run through the power feed gears here, just make sure that's all working. That's the carrot feed. This is the highest feed rate here. That all looks and sounds good. Over and down power cross feed. That looks really good. All right, I think that's it. And hey, it's never a good day when you crash a machine, but this was a great excuse to take it all apart, learn how a bunch of it works. And now I'm really comfortable doing this kind of work on this machine. Plus, I've learned I should probably order that drive pinion and keep it in stock because if I do crash the power feed, that's the part that's going to fail. I hope you enjoyed watching this little repair and you will consider getting your hands dirty on your own machines. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks to my patrons who make all of this possible. And I will see you next time.